Washington, April 6th, 1960. Memorandum from the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs to the Assistant Secretary. Classified. Subject. The Decline and Fall of Castro. Salient consideration respecting the life of the present government of Cuba are The majority of Cubans support Castro. The lowest estimate I've seen is 50%. There is no effective political opposition. Fidel Castro and other members of the Cuban government espouse or condone communist influence. Communist influence is pervading the government and the body politic at an amazingly fast rate. Militant opposition to Castro from without Cuba would only serve his and the communist cause. The only foreseeable means of alienating internal support is through disenfranchisement and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. If the above are accepted or cannot be successfully countered, it follows that every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba. If such a policy is adopted, it should be the result of a positive decision which would call forth a line of action which, while as adroit and inconspicuous as possible, makes the greatest inroads in denying money and supplies to Cuba to decrease monetary and real wages to bring about hunger, desperation and overthrow of government. The principal item in our economic quiver would be flexible authority in the sugar legislation. This needs to be sought urgently. All other avenues should be likewise explored. But first, a decision is necessary as to the line of our conduct. Would you wish to have such a proposal prepared for the Secretary? Why does the United States hate Cuba so much? They're communists, sure. But the Vietnamese government is also communist and the US doesn't have an embargo against them. In order to really understand the animosity that the US has for Cuba, we need to have a quick history lesson. The Spanish began their conquest of Cuba from the indigenous people living there in 1510. By 1527, slaves had been brought over from Africa to work in the fields of Cuba's two most lucrative agricultural exports, tobacco and sugar. In 1898, a United States Navy ship called the USS Maine sank in Havana Harbor. Without much evidence, the United States blamed Spain, which launched the Spanish-American War, at the end of which Cuba went from being a Spanish colony to being an American colony. Cuba adopted a constitution modeled after the US Constitution, and the US got to enjoy Cuba's precious sugar, tobacco, and legalized gambling. But in 1959, the Cuban Revolution ousts US-backed dictator Fulgencio Batista and becomes truly independent for the first time in over 400 years. But being politically independent means very little if you're not economically independent. To quote the famous Irish revolutionary James Connolly, If you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organization of the Socialist Republic, your efforts will be in vain. England will still rule you. She would rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords, through her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individualist institutions she has planted in this country, and watered with the tears of our mothers and the blood of our marchers. Almost the entire sugar industry in Cuba was still owned by American corporations. The new Cuban government drafted proposals for a fairly moderate land reform which would seize some of the land owned by the American corporations and give them back to the farmers who worked them. On his return to Cuba, the first priority of Fidel's revolution was the redistribution of land through the Agrarian Reform Act. <laughs> Under Batista, foreigners had owned more than 70% of the arable land. Most of the sugar industry was in U.S. hands. At first, quite modest land expropriations were proposed. They even included land owned by Fidel's family. Besides land redistribution, the reform included health care, education, housing, and road building in rural zones. Ya que nuestra reforma agraria afectó intereses de grandes compañías norteamericanas. A nosotros nos hacían la guerra por hacer la reforma agraria. Y en campo yo después Kennedy estaba promoviendo la reforma agraria en América Latina para evitar revoluciones radicales. 
you know, about a year after the agrarian reform was introduced and some American properties, rural properties, the King Ranch and so forth, were nationalized, the Cuban government ordered the foreign refineries, uh, two of which were American, to refine Soviet crude oil. I think their first inclination was to do it, but they were encouraged by the U.S. Treasury Department not to. So they refused. They would not refine the Soviet crude. The Cuban government then nationalized those refineries, the oil companies in Cuba. The United States retaliated for that by cutting off the Cuban sugar quota, and Cuba then retaliated for that by nationalizing all U.S. properties in Cuba. Compañía Cubana de Electricidad. And in October of 1960, the United States imposed the embargo against Cuba. So it was sort of one step led to another. That is, as succinctly as I could put it, the story behind how the Cuban embargo came to be. But now on to the actual thesis of this video. The embargo is an act of genocide against Cuba. In 2019, Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez Parilla argued that the US embargo against Cuba qualifies as an act of genocide under Articles 2, B, and C of the United Nations Genocide Convention. They read, Article 2. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. A. Killing members of the group. B. Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, d. imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, e. forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. On June 23, 2021, a total of 184 countries in the United Nations General Assembly voted in favor of a resolution which demanded an end to the U.S. embargo against Cuba. Only two countries voted against the United States and Israel. This was the 29th year in a row that the United Nations has voted to end the embargo, but the US doesn't seem to want to end it anytime soon. President Joe Biden has said that normalizing relations with Cuba is simply, quote, not a priority for this administration, nor is closing the illegal prison camp in Guantanamo Bay. The Cuban embargo enacted 62 years ago on October 19, 1960, makes it illegal for any American business or any subsidiary of an American business or any business with any commercial activity in the United States to conduct trade with Cuban businesses or government agencies. The embargo has been criticized by human rights organizations such as Amnesty International and the American Association for World Health who raise concerns over the embargo's effect on the Cuban people's access to food, clean drinking water, medicine and other economic needs. An article published in the Annals of Internal Medicine by Professor Michele Barry, who is a specialist in the globalization-induced health problems of low-income countries, argues that the embargo is responsible for shortages of medical supplies, which has led to several public health catastrophes. Another article published in the American Journal of Public Health concludes that, quote, to be consistent with international humanitarian laws, embargoes must not impede access to essential humanitarian goods. Yet this embargo has raised the cost of medical supplies. Food rationing, universal access to primary health services, a highly educated population, and preferential access to scarce goods for women and children help protect most Cubans from what otherwise might have been a health disaster. In the year 2000, it was declared that the embargo would no longer prevent the shipment of food or humanitarian aid to Cuba, but this change seems to only have been implemented on paper and not in practice. Just last year, money raised in a Swiss humanitarian campaign to aid Cubans in their struggle against COVID-19 was prevented from being transferred by three Swiss banks, UBS, Bank Claire, and BLKB, who feared sanction by the US State Department if they allowed the donations to reach Cuba. 
Indeed, it seems like in the last year of Donald Trump's presidency, when the coronavirus reached Cuba, the embargo was tightened rather than loosened. According to the Cuban Ministry of Public Health, seven companies that had agreed to act as suppliers for the Cuban Public Health Service told them that, fearing sanctions from the United States, they had to suspend any and all commercial relations with Cuba. MediCuba contacted more than 70 US-based firms to inquire about the possibilities of importing medicine, medical equipment, or other necessary supplies for the Cuban Public Health Service. Only three companies even responded, and they stated that they could not establish commercial ties with Cuban entities due to the embargo. The following is a list of examples of pharmaceutical and medical supply companies named by the Cuban Ministry of Public Health which have either been directly prevented from supplying the Cuban Public Health Service with medical equipment or have made internal policy changes that prevents them from having commercial ties with Cuban entities as a precautionary measure against sanction by the US government. Terumo, a Japan-based medical equipment corporation, has been prevented from supplying Cuba with blood bags. Terumo is not an American corporation, but they have made acquisitions of American companies in the past, and that's enough for them to be prevented from having any commercial relations with Cuba. Three Indian biopharmaceutical companies, the Serum Institute of India, RHR Medicare, and Apex Drug House, have been prevented from supplying Cuba with doses of the BCG and MMR vaccines used to vaccinate children against tuberculosis, measles, mumps, and rubella. Janssen Pharmaceutical Company, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, has been prevented from supplying Cuba with abiraterone acetate, a medication used to treat prostate cancer. Pfizer has been prevented from supplying Cuba with palposilib, palbociclib, sunitinib, sunitinib, and chrysotinib, chrysotinib, which are medications used to treat breast cancer, renal cell carcinoma, and non-small cell lung carcinoma, respectively. Alibaba has been prevented from donating, free of charge, medical supplies, namely masks, rapid diagnostic test kits, and ventilators to Cuba. Nanostring technologies have been prevented from sharing the Illumina dye sequencing technique used to sequence the genomes of malignant tumors with Cuba. Merck & Co. Incorporated has been prevented from supplying Cuba with Pembrolizumab. Pembrolizumab. A humanized antibody used in cancer immunotherapy that treats melanoma, lung cancer, head and neck cancer, Hodgkin lymphoma, and stomach cancer. Swiss manufacturers MTG Medical and Asutronic, after being acquired by the American-based Viare Medical Incorporated, have been prevented from supplying Cuba with ventilators. In 2020, a ship transporting raw materials to Cuba for the use in producing medication was prevented from unloading their cargo after the bank involved in the transaction decided not to make the payment out of fear that they would be sanctioned by the US government. This is not a minor sanction. This is a 60-year embargo designed to intentionally create hunger and desperation to make the Cuban population so desperate so as to not have any choice but to overthrow their own government. The United States is starving the Cuban people for political gain because they don't like the Cuban government. Deliberately causing hunger in another nation like this satisfies the definition of genocide in Article 2C of the United Nations Genocide Convention. The Cuban embargo is an ongoing genocide.